Please bow and pray with me. Lord, Heavenly Father, as Jesus commanded, I pray that you would unbind us, that we would see this glorious truth revealed when you resurrected your servant Lazarus. And as you sent your Holy Spirit to breathe life into the dry bones in Ezekiel 37, I so I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to breathe life into our dry bones, for we need you. Send your Holy Spirit that you, Lord Jesus, would be high and lifted up, that we would all be drawn to you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This is not in the sermon, so I'm already deviating from the sermon. But I was talking to my boys in uh, our youth Sunday school, and the question came, do you worry about where you're going to get your next meal? And just think about that for yourself. Are you worried about where you're going to find food when you leave this place? Of course, many of you think, well, no, because we're going to go out the door and there's going to be food waiting right there for us. Such is the circumstance that we find in the West. I mean, we don't ever think and and become concerned greatly, many of us, not to suggest that there are not people without, but by and large, in the West, that is what we're dealing with. We don't have a need, do we? I think it's the same with life. And it's not an accident that in the West, we push the idea of death and dying off to the fringes. Partly because we don't want to see it, right? And if you don't see it, then is it really a need? But here, we are thrusted into this very need with this death of Lazarus. And you might think, why is this coming? I mean, uh, we're dealing with a resurrection, but this is before Easter. We're in the season of Lent. And I think it's because this is where we need to continually go. We must always remember uh, our uh, mortality. We will not live forever. Because of sin, death has entered into this place. And in this season of Lent, we are forced to confront it. Oops. Sorry, Chris, would you get some, um, yeah, napkins? It's okay. Here, hey, you can, yeah, just go right, here you go. Would you bow and pray with me one more time? Lord, we thank you for this day. I do pray your blessing be upon your servant, Aiden. I thank you for that little guy. And I just pray right now where he is not feeling well, I just pray that you would help him feel uh, relief and feel much better. Lord, help us focus now on your eternal word. The very fact that viruses exist is because of the fall. And Lord, you came to take on the virus of our sin so that we could be healed. Bring healing to Aiden now and bring healing to us and help us now as we enter into studying your word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you, Julia. Well, not to make light of uh, of sweet Aiden, but uh, that very circumstance uh, helps us focus on the fact that uh, the world is not functioning as it should, is it? We need Jesus, and uh, and the fact that viruses and death are here uh, stresses this very need. And so in the season of Lent, this is what we're doing, and we are thrusted with death in front of us. And again, in the West, this is pushed off to the side, and we do not focus on it, but here we need to. And it comes right before Easter, right before Palm Sunday. And so this is where I'll pick up. And if you have your pew Bibles in front of you, please take them out to the lectionary actually cuts off the last part of this important uh, passage, probably to spare the preacher or whoever is reading the gospel because it is uh, a long chapter. But please take out your pew Bibles. You can have your bulletin, but again, you'll miss the last part. I think it's verses 45 through 54. But uh, we're going to get to those. But we're going to pick up in verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks 
Martha, do you believe this? Well, how are we to understand this colossal passage, this seventh and arguably most spectacular sign of Jesus? Well, John doesn't want us to miss the answer. And if you go to the end of his gospel in John chapter 20, he tells us why. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay, well and good. But why does this sign come at the very end? You know, there are seven I am statements and there are seven great miracles and this one comes at the end. Well, let me just ask you, how do we as humans deal with death? Perhaps Dylan Thomas summed it up best in a poem that he wrote to his dying father. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end know dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning they. Do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright. Their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late, they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight. Blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, Curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. But the question comes, why do we rage? Well, it's because death is not right. And you see this almost in everyone. You, in materials, they'll say, well, this is actually a part of life. But it's not true. No, and at a very basic level, in our core, we recognize that death is not supposed to be. Life is supposed to be. And so that brings up the question, how can we not lose life? How can we gain it? How can we keep it? And the answer is by tapping into Jesus Christ. That is the very reason that he came. And that is why his last miracle and I am statement are so vital for us to understand. But how can we understand them? Well, by answering three questions, or rather looking at three crucial points. Love delayed, love diverted, and then finally, love disregarded. Love delayed, love diverted, love disregarded. So first, love delayed. This is what we read in verses 1 through 6. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. His sisters, Mary and Martha, sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. Well, that's a bit of a non sequitur, isn't it? You know, quick, you know, come Lord Jesus. We know you can heal him. You just have to come right now. And so Jesus hearing it says, you know what, boys, let's wait two days longer. Well, if... He truly loved Lazarus, which clearly he did. And if he had the power to do something about it, which everyone knows around him that he does, then why does he delay two days longer? Well, Jesus supplies the answer in verses 14 through 15. Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad, so that you may believe. What in the world is going on? This story is all about the ways in which Jesus surprises people by overturning their expectations. I mean, look at these. He doesn't come when his sisters, his loved ones, ask him to come to help his uh, or their dying brother, right? And when he does go, he goes against the wishes of the disciples. Look at verse 8 and 16. They're like, don't go there because if you go to Jerusalem, what's going to happen to him? He's going to get killed, right? But then he goes. He referred to death as sleep, which confuses the disciples and thinking, well, he's talking about ordinary sleep. And then he has to tell them plainly, I'm talking about death. Lazarus is dead. 
Then in verse 9, he offers up a strange little saying about walking in the day, right? About those who walk during the day don't stumble, but those who walk at night do. What is Jesus getting at? Jesus seems to be saying that the only sure way to know that we are headed in the right direction is by following him. If we try to direct our lives through our own understanding, we'll stumble because we'll be in the dark. But if we stick close to Jesus and see our situation from his point of view, then we will end up in the right place in the end. Even though at times the, right, the, the route might not make any sense at all. Do you know what that means? Have you ever experienced that? You're going through life and something happens and you're like, that, I don't have a good word for it. That was not pleasant. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. I don't know why the Lord allowed this to happen. Have you ever had an experience like that? I think what we're seeing here is that we're called to trust in those moments, to trust that God might be doing something that we might not understand. It's like uh, in Alpha, for those of you who are helping out with Alpha right now, uh, Corey Ten Boom has that great uh, line where she says, if you're on a, a train and you go through a tunnel, you know, you don't jump out of the train, you know, and thinking, well, you know, all is lost. No, what do you do if you go through a, a tunnel on a train? You trust the conductor. <laughs> You sit patiently and wait till you get through on the other side. You see that. Love delayed. So maybe some of you are there right now. Maybe sometimes, and it's difficult to follow Jesus. Maybe Jesus is having you, you know, follow him. And people are looking at you. Maybe at work, maybe neighbors, maybe at school. And they're like, you're crazy. The route doesn't seem to be getting you where you want. It's not happy. But what we're seeing is if we trust our own understanding in those situations, we'll be walking in the dark. But if we follow Jesus, we might go through dark times, but in the end, we will end up in the right place. And the case in point is Lazarus. Why did Jesus not go to him straight away? Well, in order that his glory might be revealed, in order that he might truly show us his love. Did you hear that? He said to them, I was glad that I was not there and that he died so that you may believe. Thus he delayed his return, which we see is actually delayed love. When the messenger arrived back home, this is the messenger that came and told Jesus, right? Many commentators point out that by the time the messenger got to Jesus, Lazarus had already been dead. And if you do the numbers, you know, he'd been dead for four days. He really was. The messenger got there and, um, you know, he was dead by that point. But if the messenger arrived back home and discovered that Lazarus had been dead and buried, what would Jesus' message convey to the grieving sisters now that their brother was in the tomb and had been buried for many days? Well, just this. Jesus was urging them to believe his word, no matter how discouraging their circumstances. Isn't that a good point? <laughs> to believe Jesus, no matter what our circumstances show us. Jesus never said that Lazarus wouldn't die. He merely said in verse 4, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. We just talked about that in John chapter 9. Remember the man born blind? And the disciples were like, well, who sinned that made this man blind? You remember what Jesus said? He said, what matters is not the sin that made this man blind. This man is blind so that the glory of God might be revealed. Same thing. He wanted his disciples to lay hold of his promise. When we find ourselves confronted by disease, disappointment, delay, or even death, we must turn to Christ in his word. We must live by faith and not by sight. Though their situation seemed hopeless, Jesus' delayed love and ultimate miracle would send out a shockwave that <laughs> is still causing waves today. The very fact that we're talking about it, right? That brings us to our second point, diverted love. This is what we read in verses 21 through 26. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die die. Well, let me ask you a question, and the pilots in the room will probably know this, but, you know, if you're flying, why, uh, why does your plane get diverted? 
like you're flying back someplace, you know, to Jacksonville? Why would they divert you to Atlanta? Well, a lot of people said something, but bad weather or an emergency, right? Those are two examples. Martha is distraught and deep within the storm clouds of grief, so much so that a future resurrection isn't bringing her any consolation. Just like us, right? When we go through some difficulty, oftentimes we get lost in the storm. And so what does Jesus do? He says, you know, look at me. He diverts her attention to himself. And he, and he says, Martha, the future is right here in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. And I love it too because if you look at when he says that, he says, do you understand this? Do you see this? He's not just come from heaven to earth, as the song goes, but he has brought the future into the present, into the mud and muck of our world. The resurrection isn't just a doctrine or a future fact. It is a person. And that person is standing right in front of Martha, helping her make the connection as to who he is. It is not a matter of if only, because Jesus is life itself. In verses 27 through 28, Martha confesses that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And then she runs off and she gets Mary. Now with Mary, we find the God-man Jesus Christ bursting into tears and fulfilling what the prophet proclaimed in Isaiah 53 verse 4. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He's not some robot who is detached from the horrors of sin and death. No, God became man in the person of Jesus Christ and we see him weeping next to us. But unlike us, he has the power to do something about death. And here we find that this passage points us forward to questions that will be asked of Jesus' own death. Look at them. Couldn't this man who did so many signs have brought about the fact that he himself could, you know, stay alive and not die? Couldn't the one who saved so many have not saved himself? John is telling us the answer by a thousand hints and images throughout his gospel. It is only through, through Jesus' death, it is only through his own sharing of the common fate of humanity that the world can be saved. There is a line straight from Jesus' tears here in verse 35 to Jesus' own death in which he will share not only in our grief but in the terror that we all face. And again, can't you hear the poet? Do not go gentle into the good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Into this terror steps Jesus Christ, and he commands that the stone be taken away. And I love Martha. She says, but the smell, Jesus. To which Jesus says in verse 40, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then in a loud voice, Jesus cried out in verse 43, Lazarus, come out. And Charles Spurgeon still has the best commentary on this. He said if Jesus didn't qualify, if he didn't say Lazarus' name, then the whole graveyard would have come to life. And I think that's absolutely right. Why? Because that's who Jesus is. He is God incarnate. God with us. That is his power. And here he was diverting not just Martha and Mary's attention, but all of ours. Do we see this? You can hear him ask Martha, do you understand and that brings us to the final point. And this is, uh, I think, probably even more amazing than the miracle. This is disregarded love. And this is where I would have you turn to your Bibles at the very final section, verses, I think, 45 through 54. Disregarded love. I know this seems amazing, but this miracle actually led people not only to disregard Jesus, but then to want him dead. Look at verses 47 through 48. After countless people start putting their faith in Christ, the Pharisees and chief priests get together, and this is what they say. What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. How very reminiscent of John 9, where G Jesus heals a man born blind. You know, bringing someone uh, sight who had been blind, you know, if I saw that, I'd be like... I would believe in him, right? Many modern people think that this would be the case. But do you know what happened in John chapter 9? Did everyone believe in Jesus after he brought sight to this blind man? Not just, in, you know, he wasn't just blind at some point in life. He was born blind. Did they say, yeah, let's follow him? No. You remember? They threw the, the man who had been given sight out of the temple. They began to oppose him all the more. 
But what could motivate someone who had just seen a resurrection then move to plot a murder? What's the motivation? Simple. Then is now. Power. Power is what the Pharisees and chief priests loved, and they had it, and it was threatened by Jesus. For if everyone believed in him, then their place at the top of the Jewish power structure would be removed. This is what they saw. Thus, verse 53 informs us that from that day they sought to kill him. Amazingly, in words meant for political expediency, but God meant for prophecy, Caiaphas gets up and he says to his fellow Jewish leaders, you know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He said more than he had any idea. But let's not miss the irony here. Caiaphas had said that it would be better to kill Jesus than to let the whole nation perish. But guess what happened to the nation of Israel in just uh, a few decades? In 70 AD. Do you know what happened to that nation? Man, the Romans came in. And they just raised it to the ground. Jerusalem, the temple. The the Jewish historian Josephus wrote this. He said a plow was even drawn across the temple area in order to emphasize the desolation. What might have happened had the chief priests and the Pharisees actually received Jesus instead of disregarding him? Well, we can't say for sure. But what we can say for sure is that they did not And as Barclay said, the very steps they took to save their nation destroyed it. People still try to cling to power. And I don't want to even even want to go on. I don't want to lose that moment. What are you clinging on to right now thinking, I can't give this up because this is what is bringing me joy. That's just like the Pharisees. And they were clinging to it. And the very thing that they clung to led to their destruction. We can't miss that point. People still do this today with power, with many different things. And as the poet so clearly showed us, we are all desperately clinging to life. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. But here, John wants us to see that unless we connect to Jesus, unless we cling to Jesus, life itself will be stripped away from us. For you see, the whole point of the death and resurrection of Lazarus was to point us to the ultimate death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe that the reason this miracle was the last of Jesus' seven great signs was to let us see that in order for him to stop our death, he must die himself. That is, in order for him to stop our funeral, he must experience a funeral himself. In so doing, his death brought life to all those who would turn and cling to him. Fifty years before the birth of Christ, the Roman consul, Servius Sulpicus Rufus, wrote a letter to the great orator Cicero. Cicero, you will know, inspired almost all of our founding fathers. And if you read any of the founding fathers, one of the main people they quote is Cicero. And so Rufus wrote Cicero on the occasion of the death of his beloved daughter, Tolia. It was a beautiful and heartfelt letter, and you can look it up after the service that encouraged him to remember that his daughter had only experienced the common lot of all mankind. And she had the fortune of at least passing away before the fall of the Republic. Because if you go back and study Cicero's time, that's their their big concern. And this is what Cicero wrote in response. He said, For there is no Republic now to offer me a refuge and a consolation by its good fortunes when I leave my home in sorrow. As there once was a home to receive me when I returned saddened by the state of public affairs. I mean, he was a great writer. (laughs) If you don't believe me, just go and read some of that stuff. But he said poetically, very clearly, uh, what is true for all of us, right? It was a heartfelt letter, but all it did was magnify his loss. A century after that. And I love the timing of this, too, because it's not an accident. A century after that, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the Christians living in Thessalonica, who, similar to Cicero, had become discouraged at the death of their own loved ones. While Paul's letter was equally sympathetic and heartfelt, it contained something profoundly different. It possessed the certain hope of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Do you hear that language again? Those who fall asleep. Or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. 
We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Of course, we know the very fact that, that Paul became a Christian was because he saw the resurrected Jesus. What a remarkable contrast to the letter that Cicero received. What a remarkable reality all those possess who turn and cling to Jesus Christ. Remember again what Jesus told Martha. He was diverting her. She was in the storm clouds, and she, was, she couldn't be consolated. And he said, focus on me. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Dylan Thomas wrote, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Because if you don't have Christ and life is all you have, then you must rage. Because once you lose life, it's all gone. But interestingly, the Christian poet, George Herbert, wrote these words. Death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him just a gardener. Let us pray. Lord, what a day already, what a week, what a season. I pray, Lord, that um, as, uh, as stark as uh, watching sweet Aiden get sick, I pray, Lord, that we would all see that we are greatly sick and that we think that we have no needs, that we think that this life will go on forever. But you're showing us that in this passage that uh, because of sin, death is going to come upon all of us. But those who turn to you will live because you died so that we could live. You had a funeral so that you could stop ours. Lord, help us be roused from the stupor of this life to see you clearly and be forever changed. We thank you and we praise you that you are the resurrection and the life. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.